Welcome to the Ocean Cruises podcast hosted by Andy H. This week we are speaking with Taylor Francis from the YouTube channel Taylor's Travels. Taylor is from Canada and has just started out as a full-time live aboard solo sailor on her Catalina Morgan 38. She is in the final stages of completing a mechanical refit. She lived in an 80s vintage camper van before moving aboard her first freshwater sailboat at Tanzer 26 in the Great Lakes of Canada. She is a motorcycle enthusiast and a talented guitarist. She recently gained a wealth of blue water cruising experience crewing aboard an ML Super Amaramu 2000, making passage through the Caribbean and now plans to use that knowledge to take her boat from South of Florida to Panama. You can learn more about Taylor on her YouTube channel, Taylor's Travels. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook. Watch the interviews on YouTube and download the audio on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. The Ocean Cruises podcast will be hosting their first annual charter in October of 2021. Hosted by Sailor George Charters in the beautiful island of Syros in Greece. Joining us on a fabulous 56-foot Ocean Star Sailing Yacht will be our Ocean Cruisers, Mandy and Alex of See the Little Things, Maddie and Herbie of The Rigging Doctor, Michael and Joel of Bums on a Boat, Judy and Steve of Sailing Fur Isle, and Josh Post. Follow us on our Instagram and Facebook pages for regular updates and make sure you are following our guests' YouTube channels to watch their coverage and keep your eye on our YouTube page for a full series of The Charter. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how's, the, uh, how's the boat going? Good. It's been kind of just a big process moving back on board. Um, it's back in the water now, which is really nice. nice. And I've just been kind of moving all my stuff in getting things cleaned up. And so, I mean, ever since having kind of the whole big engine project that was yeah. done on it the last couple of months, and then I had to leave the country just with me being a Canadian and time in the U S and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I kind of had to like pack up the boat in such a rush to like get out of there and then coming back to it and kind of a mess and having to like deal with my former self's problems. It's <laughs> just like just going back to reality kind of yeah exactly yeah <laughs> yeah what so what was like I know you you said in um one of your videos that I saw that like you thought the head gasket was blown out or like it needed a new one was that the only problem or was there just like a litany of issues with no it? no it's it, that was it was kind of a cascading effect and that was more or less the last straw of it all right um because it had been overheating a lot previously to that and every time that I had tried to work it out, I would seem to find the problem and then it wouldn't overheat for like a month or two mm. and everything would seem fine. And then it would happen again. And then not only that, the wiring in this thing is just a nightmare. And yeah. most, basically the only gauge that I had up at the helm that worked was um, my tachometer and that was it. Oh, right. The gauge didn't work nothing with the ignition worked so like the glow plugs you know things like that and mm. then yeah leaking oil and overall i mean it's a <laughs> everything <laughs> almost a 30 year old engine yeah what type of engine was it that was in it's it was a westerbeak westerbeak they think... nicknamed them wester broken because uh they're not notoriously yeah. good engines I think those are the same ones that they used to put in the uh, Moody's like back in the day. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they were because it was Wester. Yeah, it was Wester something. I could be wrong. But if so, they would, they've also got like a terrible. No, I might be wrong. I think I might be wrong. But in, the, anyway. in the voting world, they don't have a, a shiny reputation, I wouldn't say. Yeah. Um, so in kind of doing my research and deciding that I was going to replace it because the, you know, I had I been able to have the time, like if I didn't have to leave the country and if I was maybe slightly more mechanically inclined, then I would maybe try to rebuild it. But the thing with that is, is the way that it's, my galley is laid out, it's the whole thing is fiberglass in around it in one solid piece. Yeah. So you can't really remove anything or take it apart or redo it properly 
still in place. Yeah. So the old one would have involved having to pull it out anyway. And if I can't be here to do the work and I'm going to be paying somebody, you know, but at the end of the day, it's going to cost almost mm. just as much as a new one anyway to, to rebuild the old one. And so I was looking at Yanmar and then looking at um, Beta Marine was the other All one. Right. And so those two were kind of my top two choices. And I really, really wanted to go with Yanmar just because they're so well known within the industry. But um, ultimately, just because everything's electronically done on that, it, you know, if you get struck by lightning, you're screwed. All your electronics are done. You, your engine still can't even work. Mm. Whereas, you know, with the beta's more mechanical style, you can kind of do everything yourself and you can find parts really easily. Whereas, you know, with Yanmar, you have to come and get a Yanmar technician to come and get a, bring a computer to diagnose your engine and what's going uh, on, right? So overall, I ended up going with a beta marine. Uh, oh, that's good what choice. I replaced it with. And so, yeah, it was a big, you know, I was going back and forth and it was a big decision. And now that it's done, I feel really good that, that it's done. Yeah, because I know as well with the Yanmars, it's like if you don't get... Again, I could just be talking absolute nonsense, but this is what I've heard. If you don't get a Yanmar certified mechanic to actually install it, then they don't they they won't have you they won't allow you to utilize the warrant uh, the guarantee on it or something like warranty, that. Yeah, and then even once it has been installed, I think your first kind of maintenance, like once you reach fifty hours and then one hundred and fifty hours, and you have to change fluids and filters and oil change and all that. I think even that stuff has to be done by a certified Yanmar person as well. Oh, that's first, like that break in period. Yeah. I mean, that could genuinely be impossible. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? well, that's like, if you're trying to cruise and you've got a new engine and you're trying to use yeah. that to go somewhere, you know, you're not stopping at 50 hours and 100 hours to get that done by somebody, especially if you're, you're in somewhere like Central America or something. Yeah. It's not they, as easy to come by as in the States. Yeah, that's it's like some of the car manufacturers do that. Like they'll still say, "Oh yeah, you've got like a warranty up to hundred thousand kilometers," and you're like, "Oh wow, amazing!" But then if you don't do like every minor and major service with them, then it's void. And then mm -hmm. if you get it done by them, it costs a fortune. So it's like the car just costs like you know thirty percent more. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So which which uh, horsepower Beta Marine one did you end up going with? Fifty. So that's a lot of power for the size boat you've got. Yeah, it was. I had a 40 in it before. Yeah. Um, and so the only reason why I really went up is because the 45, I wanted to go up a little bit anyway. I was looking at the 45s, hmm. um, but it's the exact same profile and footprint. It take, It's the exact same. It just has different, you know, parts in it yeah. that add the horsepower. Pulled out differently. So, Considering it was the same profile and this took up the same amount of space and everything, I was like, well, why not? Then when you're mm -hmm. cruising, you can cruise at a much lower RPM. And then yeah. you still, you know, if you are in rough seas or you have somewhere where you really need it, then you know that you've got it. And, you know, diesels like to be run hard. So then you can, you have that at your disposal to be able to use, you know? Yeah. It, you know, like it's it's such a good thing we um like whenever i go out cruising with a couple of my friends who've got like much lighter displacement boats um they'd love like a 20 or a 30 horsepower engine but because their boats are so light like they they can do like 2000 rpms and they'll be going at like six and a half knots mm -hmm. like in my boat if i'm doing 2000 rpms i will live I'll, I'll i'll be bored like it like we're just not yeah. going anywhere you're doing like yeah. four and a half and yeah. it makes such a massive difference mm -hmm. definitely but, what was the beta marine stuff like with like the uh, the warranties and the guarantees and all that? Um, so I think install, it has to be installed within certain specifications. So like it can only be installed and aligned at a certain angle range. So like yeah. the engine can be no more than 15 degrees to align with the prop shaft and mm. things like that. So there's like certain parameters that it has to be installed within to keep the warranty but then as far as like the break-in period and the oil changes and the maintenance and stuff like that you can just do that yourself yeah oh that's cool and the price is probably I, I imagine it would have been a little bit cheaper than going for Yamaha as well it is really windy out today was that wind yeah i yeah. i took my bimini down just because it's been like flapping all over the place with how much wind we have mm. so um where are you in Stewart, Florida. 
Oh, nice. All right. Yeah, okay. we've got like a nice 25 knot north wind like blowing through here right yeah. now. What's the temperature like there at, at this time of year? Um, I mean, I'm in Celsius, so I don't know. I don't use Fahrenheit, but it's like I'm, 20, I'm British, so I'm Celsius. 2025. 20, <laughs> right. Uh, so that's quite warm. Yeah. Yeah, kind of similar to where we are as well. Um, cool. So just like going because you know you're on like a 38 foot boat now and you're solo sailing and you've got big plans and stuff which is really good like well done that's amazing um so this all started uh like on was was it on a lake you had your first boat yeah so yeah. um in canada obviously we have the great lakes which are yep. you know great famous for being basically freshwater oceans yeah and so yeah i bought my first sailboat when i was 19 and just kept it in a marina there and worked at the marina at a restaurant that was there and lived on board with my friend for the summer and yeah just kind of i had grown up sailing a little bit with my family on that same lake it's lake huron okay and so i just kind of got back into it a little bit and it kind of escalated from there <laughs> <laughs> well, it escalated, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's cool. What what made you want to do that? I mean, did, were you always like an outdoorsy type of person? Did you do a lot of camping or walking, or was it just sailing that you were into? Yeah, I mean, uh, my family like had this little hundred twenty five foot sailboat oh, nice. that we had growing up, and that was basically our cottage. So we would go there on the weekends, and the whole family would stay on there, and we would sail and. So I think that was kind of where the first influence came from. And then my parents sold the boat and I totally forgot that sailing was even a thing for quite a few years. Hmm. And then I did the van life thing, which that was something that I always really wanted to do, like was super passionate about doing that. And then through doing that, I kind of realized and remembered like how similar that way of life is and how much of the same things apply to, you know, living on a boat. Yeah. And um, I went traveling through Thailand and saw so many like charter catamarans yeah. and stuff like that. And I was like, man, it just kind of like came back to me. I was like, people do this. And then when <laughs> I went back to Canada, I saw a Facebook ad for this boat that was for sale. And so me and my friend went and looked at it and bought it. And so I think it kind of transitioned partially from like my history growing up and then doing the van life thing. It just was so natural to just go in that direction yeah where in uh, thailand did you go all over I, we spent about yeah. a month backpacking and it's like we flew into bangkok and then went up to the north in Chiang mai and then did the okay. little islands all around and yeah it was an awesome trip yeah it's like one of the i, I think yeah, one of the, not maybe the most. So I'm really looking forward to like arriving in the Maldives one day. But yeah, doing like the islands of Thailand is like, it, by sailboat is just incredible. Yeah. Like such a beautiful place. That's a and dream. It's, yeah, it's the dream. And it's so, so cheap. Like you can just go to shore and eat like, you know, the most amazing curry for like $1. Yeah, that uh, was the best thing. <laughs> I think like we were so young when we went, I think our whole budget was $1,000 for the entire month, including- for a month including like hotels food activities everything that's really we did low. It. like we, we <laughs> might have went a little over budget we might have went slightly over budget but we pretty much didn't spend like much more than that it was super easy to stay within that because of how cheap everything is yeah was this a, was this like a long time ago well uh, i think we were 18 it was before we bought the boat so yeah we were 18 so 2018 no, all oh, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I suppose. Yeah, probably. But yeah, I think I, last time I was there, it was like 2016 and it was still super cheap. But I remember because I went like way, way before that, I think like 2012 or something like that. And um, yeah, the prices had like doubled, which still I'm not really complaining about because it went from like, you know, 50 cents to a beer to like a dollar. So it wasn't like it was breaking the bank or anything. Can't complain, yeah. <laughs> no, I still wasn't complaining. I was living yeah. in Dubai at the time where it was like, $15 for a beer so um yeah it was better better than that anyway <laughs> for sure so what what made you want to just like move straight onto the boat and live on it because like getting back into sailing as a sport is is one thing but then deciding to like live on one full time and put your home on the water is completely different I mean I don't know I think the plan was 
was because where the boat was was about an hour and a half from where my parents live which is like I stay with my parents when I'm home and so at the time it was a matter of figuring out how am I going to pay for all these marina fees and all this stuff to afford the boat and use it enough that I'll actually be able to enjoy it Hmm. and so I couldn't really work a job in my hometown that's an hour and a half away because then I'd only be able to get up there on weekends and if I'm paying $3,000 for the season and I'm not even getting to go up that much, then what's the point? That's and a lot so for just, a little boat on a lake. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, the, and the, the season's only like four months, five months if you're lucky. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, and so it just became a matter of like I, pl- I applied <clears throat> for a waitressing job at the restaurant that was there and got it. And then that was my way of being able to work and afford the boat while still getting to enjoy it. And then, you know, you're not paying rent because you've already paid the marina fee and you own the boat. So after that, you can pretty much save money while working too, which is really nice. So you were like staying in the marina, working just by the marina, and then you were just like cruising around the lake. I would walk off the boat and it was like a five minute walk up the hill to the restaurant. It was a really cool restaurant though. Like it overlooked the marina and like a lot of tourists would come in there. So it was really busy and stuff. That's like an ideal setup. I would love oh, that. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I would love that. When I was making my plans when I was younger, which we're all stupid, like looking back with hindsight. Um, but yeah, what, what we intended to do was like get over to Australia and then just find places where we could sail, where we could like work on farms close by, mm-hmm. which is really stupid, but this was like quite a long time ago. So the options were like <laughs> a bit more limited for work. Yeah. I don't think the internet was really a thing back then. No, it definitely wasn't actually. The internet wasn't really a thing back then. Um, but yeah. yeah the, um, so you've got four months of sailing in Canada, where you were from. Basically, yeah. Like um, you splash usually late May, early right. June, and then haul out September. No, so yeah, a little four four months, five months, five, something five like months. that. Some people haul out in October, so if, like five months if you're lucky. But yeah, it's not very long. Same with the motorcycle riding season. It's yeah, that's or the, the same part as about Canada. Just surviving it. So, you know, so Canada is my favorite country. Um, I spent like a summer there when I was eighteen or nineteen, and like we we did a lot of driving. Uh, we went, we drove over to um, Vancouver, mm-hmm. and uh, we started in. Oh, damn it. What's the capital called? I always forget. Uh, capital of Canada. Edmonton? Oh, of Canada. Yeah. Uh, Ottawa or Toronto? Well, you should know. <laughs> you're, you're I mean, of all, I don't know. I'm not good at geography. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, uh, it's where they speak French. Oh, oh Quebec. Yeah. Oh, like no. Montreal? So that's not the capital. Yeah. Montreal. No, that's not the capital. No. Where are the politicians? In Ottawa. Right, which isn't the French part. No, it's very, very close to it. Yeah, it must be. Not, it's still in Ontario, which is not really... Right. Quebec is the French part. I think I know why I'm getting confused. So we were in, we were in the capital for National Canada Day, which was mental. Okay. Like, there was thousands yeah. of people in the streets. Yeah. It, was, it was amazing. It was really good, but it was nuts. And um, from there, I remember we did a short drive to go to a casino in like the French area where nobody would speak to me in English. Well, they could speak English. I knew they could speak English, but they were looking at me and they were like talking some French. I was like, okay, not happy. But no, it's, it's, it's my favorite country because it's, it's just like a really big, pretty version of, uh, of the UK or like the north of the UK anyway, like in terms mm-hmm. of landscape. But it's just, too, it's too cold. It's I just know. far too, it's just, far, yeah. you know, there's like, there's this guy on YouTube um, maybe he's a Canadian legend. I have no idea. I can't, I can't remember his name, but he just like danger camping or like stealth camping. So he will, um, I, I, I imagine he's just like a normal guy, but he, uh, he just like goes out at the weekends and uh, camps in like these bizarre places, like behind a Home Depot or. I think um, I know who you're talking about. I feel like, like in a tunnel. One of those videos before. I think it's like Dave Willis or no, is that an actor? No, it's Bruce Willis. Anyway, like I'm sure, I'm sure a few more people watch him, but it's crazy. So he he will go out camping in the snow everywhere, and he's got like a thermometer, and he's like, yeah, you know, it's minus twenty four, so I'm feeling a bit, a little bit chilly. I'm like, mate, I would die in minus twenty four. Yeah, I'm from the north of England, and that's that's a joke to us. Like, yeah, 
Yeah. So that's why I've kind of come up with a nice balance of I'll go home to Canada from, you know, June to September, see family. And that's basically hurricane season anyway. Yeah. Um, and then sail when it gets cold. I'm basically yeah. a snowbird. Yeah, well, that's a good match because you, you're getting like the nice parts of your home country and then you're combining it with like the, the warmer climates like down yeah. south when they're around. Yeah, that's cool. So, so from like living on the boat that you bought and you had on the lake, you then ended up uh, sailing with um, or motorboating with your friend Bobby or was, oh no, because uh, he had a big boat, he had a big sailboat mm-hmm. then. Yeah, yeah. so um, I, while I was on the sailboat with my friend, um, I've like always really liked photography and I've always been like, a more creative kind of artsy sort of person. I've never really been like athletic or anything like that. So I started making videos. Like at the time I was super into La Vagabond. And I was just obsessed with them. And so me and my friend tried to make some like little videos. They were so bad. So, so <laughs> bad. Looking and back the, on them. <laughs> yeah, but the thing was like my camera at the time, like the autofocus was broken and it was like a really good, picture camera but not for video but it was all they I bad, like from the sense of the quality or do you is it like you feel that you were cringy in them like <laughs> what both, type of bad both both all right yeah bad and we were right. cringy they and were that's very bad. Double bad yeah and uh so we, i mean we made a couple like two or three youtube videos or whatever and then uh that was how i got connected with bobby was through that like those couple of videos that i had posted and because he wanted a crew that like somewhat knew something about sailing so he didn't have to like train somebody from scratch and somebody who could kind of understand like the filming and editing side of things and could help out with that Mm. and uh so yeah i joined him uh in annapolis and we sailed all the way to the virgin islands and back nice so that gave you the bug for sailboats in warmer climates (laughs) yes yeah yeah did, so did you did you learn like quite a lot about handling uh, like how to handle a sailboat because that was a big thing like that's a big old heavy boat huge. hey yeah it's like it's a, it's a ct56 but yeah. uh the loa was more like 65 at least right because there was so a big massive. bow for it and then there was yeah. huge davits on the back as well with the dinghy and everything mm. and it's just a beast but uh a lot of the times when we were anchoring or things like that I would actually be driving the boat and uh, Bobby would go up and kind of be working the anchor and doing that side of things so I kind of gained more confidence in maneuvering the boat and operating the boat and um, you know things like that so I definitely learned a lot for sure and it's much different I think having a little lake sailboat than being on a real blue water vessel you know yeah was and your so that, your lake boat was that a tiller or was that like a st- was that yeah, a helm steering? A tiller. yeah right yeah. yeah and so it's really like you can kind of you know if it's a lake boat you can kind of test your limits a little bit more and i mean you don't have anything inside the boat that much it's not like your whole life is in that little boat you're just kind of maybe a little more reckless a little more fun like carefree mm. you know it's more of like a weekend fun go out thing but like when you're cruising on the blue water boat and it's your whole home and everything you own in there there's a lot more risk involved and yeah adds another layer of pressure which was that that was what I kind of learned and like after that and during that season of cruising with Bobby and I got to see the challenges of like what being a captain was really like like he was he's like a jack of all trades he could fix everything figure everything out whenever he had problems he could diagnose it and He was like, I could just see that you do need to be a jack of all trades in order to live this life. And at first I said to myself, I was like, I don't think I want my own boat. I don't think I want to be a captain. I don't know if I'm ready for that. I just, I'm enjoying being the crew. And then uh, I left there and went back home to Canada and sailed a little bit more on my, went back to my little boat. And then that was hard going back to something so small. <laughs> from a 60 footer to like a 25 foot. Yeah. Yeah, what is yeah. this little thing? This is like a cork yeah. bobbing around. I'm sailing my closet. And so then, yeah, I just caught the bug, you know, and I 
just started obsessively looking for boats. And it took me probably six months before I could even find something that I could go and see. Like mm. the market was so hot that I would, I would be checking vigorously like every day and there would be ads that would be posted that morning, like a few hours before. And I would call and they're like, oh, somebody's already booked a survey on it. Yeah. It was insane. The prices as well. Like I've noticed over like the last two years, like I've always like for 10, 15 years, I've always kept my eye on like different boats and how much they're worth and stuff. And it's like the models that you would see one popping up at like 150, like a couple of years ago, you don't see in that, like, you know, they're back up to like 180, 190, something like that. Yeah. So yeah, availability and price. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what, why I got pretty lucky with this one. Like it was kind of, it just ended up working out right. I actually had a deposit on another boat in California hmm. and I flew out there and didn't even finish the survey on it before deciding not to buy it. Oh, and so there was like visible issues with it. Yeah. It just, yeah, it was no good. It was a no go. And then I flew to New York to see this boat and it was kind of just a good combination of not being overly out of its price range for mm. what it's worth. And um, the layout is something that I really loved in particular. I really wanted a center cockpit to be able to have kind of like the aft cabin and it being better for crew to like have people be able to stay in the V-berth and that's yep. their dedicated area. And so it just kind of ticks a lot of the boxes and the survey went well. I mean, he didn't, he pointed a few things that obviously needed to be addressed, but it wasn't to the extent that, you know, the surveyor didn't point out anything like I would be needing a new engine. Mm. I always question yeah. the value of getting a, yeah. a pay for it. Well, it depends on the size of the boat, but like, I, you know what I think is, it depends how much you know about boats and how much you can actually check out yourself. But it's like that price range where it's somewhere between like twenty and seventy thousand dollars. If you're going to end up spending like two and a half grand getting a survey done, and you already know quite a lot about boats, I don't know. Like people will probably hate me for saying that, but yeah. I don't see the value in it so much. Well, and that's the thing. It's like a lot of it was a formality, and so for insurance, because you know, oh. for insurance and and then ownership and like things like that, you know, you need to have a current survey, and so that was really the only reason why I did it because he, he didn't give me much more information than I was already kind of had could tell like I had some other friends and people come on board and check out everything who were fairly knowledgeable hmm. and so he it wasn't like he gave me much more information for the value it was one of those things where it was like kind of one of those things you have to do yeah and I get a lot of people who say to me like why didn't the surveyor point that out or how could he not find that and I mean they're looking at the whole boat and they're not looking into every detail they're kind of brushing over all the parts looking at the hull looking at the rigging looking at all this and if they're mm. not you know an engine expert and they're not a mechanic they I just would just expect it over. a boat surveyor to be like an engine expert <laughs> it's like in you my opinion think. you it's would like think. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the sails, you can visibly check. I mean, you know, yeah. you can you can see if it's ripping or you can test a few of the threads to see if the, the weak. But like, I, I think the engine is something that it, like to the point where you literally needed a new engine, which is, I don't know, like 10, 20,000, something crazy, yeah. like yeah. To, to not pick up on blaringly obvious i mean a head gasket going as well it's not like they just go Poop, and blow it's the, they're usually like leaking in a bit from somewhere or leaking out a bit for yeah. a while before they do that yeah but um yeah not dissing surveyors because i'm sure there's some glorious surveyors out there but like i swear every person who i know who's had one has just come back and they've been like yeah it was a waste of money like i spent this much and there was these problems and these problems that weren't highlighted and i wouldn't have got the boat or i would have got the price knocked down or whatever and it was even really hard to find a surveyor at the time i was scrambling around i was in new york at the time and i was scrambling around to I called every surveyor there probably was even in nearing nearby states and stuff and mm -hmm. Either they weren't available, they were too busy, or they don't serve that area, or this and that. Like the guy that I ended up getting, I'm pretty sure he called himself out of retirement for this job. Um, <laughs> like it was, okay. it was like, I, but I couldn't get anybody else. I couldn't, everybody that I contacted 
that other people had recommended were saying, you know, it's like a month before I'll be able to do that. Yeah. And it was, I think, especially with COVID at the time, things were just weird. Everybody was buying mm. boats and surveyors were crazy. Yeah. I remember when I got mine, so mine's like 34 foot. And um, I was just like, oh, I'll just see if there's any surveyors like close by. And there was a couple in Spain and like the cheapest price I got, like including flights and um, staying overnight, it was working out like one and a thousand euros, which is like, I don't know, $2,000. And I was yeah. like, I, the engine's perfect. It had like hardly any hours on it. The sails are fine. We took it out of the water. There was nothing wrong with the hull. Um, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go. just <laughs> go with it. Yeah, I'll yeah. just go with this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, what boats were contenders when you, uh, when you started the hunt? Yeah, I don't know. It was funny because, this, so this is a Catalina Morgan. Um, and so, you know, it's not just a Catalina, it's not just a Morgan, it's like this weird hybrid of both. And I, n Catalina was not even on my radar at all. It was not something that I wanted. I didn't particularly like them or care for them. Um, I was looking at um, the one that I really did like, it was this Islander Freeport 36. Okay. And it's a Robert Perry design. So it was like a mini version a of older. 56. And right. so that one I really liked. And I found a few of them, but a lot of them weren't in very good shape. The one that I went to look at in California was an Irwin, another center cockpit. Yep. Um, but I don't know. I was kind of just looking at anything that was right within that price range, which is hard when you're when you have a limited budget, it's really hard to be selective on the names that you want yeah you know just, so I was so, just kind of, sorry go ahead did, did you ever consider like any more of the more modern type of production boats because the ones that you've mentioned are all like 80s 90s no i things. yeah 80s 80s stuff is like my whole thing like right that's my vans in 89 my motorcycles in 87 my first sailboat was a 78 and right. so I'm very keen to the older style. I just love yeah. the character of them and how much personality they have. Like, that's the thing that I don't find as much with the newer production boats is, you know, you know they, they kind of, some of them seem to be more like Ikea boats. Like they don't have the same character yeah. or charm or warmth to them. Yeah. And um, so, and they were, again, those newer production boats were just astronomically out of my price range which with how much they had been bumped up in price versus what mm. they were really worth yeah like i literally said exactly the same thing we, we were looking at a bunch just like a load of different types of boats a few weeks ago and we were in greece and uh we had to look at like some benetos i actually thought beneto were pretty nice like the newer ones they were pretty mm -hmm. like they were quite tough inside but then we had to look at some Bavarias, like the new types of Bavarias. And I was walking around and it was just like you could everything you touch, you could hear it ping or there was something hollow behind Freaking it. Or yeah, yeah. yeah, like the door, like this thing was two years old and like the door handles are falling off and stuff. And I, I said to my wife, I was just like, this is this is like something you'd expect from Ikea, yeah. you know, like, like the Clapham Bavaria, whatever or something. And it's just like falling apart after a couple of years. Um, I think the old ones are good. But um. Yeah, I think you you do have to spend a lot of money on like one of the more modern production boats, especially mm -hmm. if you want to get like a center cockpit type or something yeah, similar exactly. to what you've got now. Yeah. And then there's the trade off of when you're looking into that older age range, it's obviously you're coming, you're buying a handful of problems with it just because of its age, usually. And so this, my boat is a 94, which for what I had been looking at was quite new on, yeah, the, yeah. on the spectrum. I was, I was pretty happy about that. And uh, the thing that I do really like about it is that it has a lot of the nice, like warm wood teak features inside, but out on deck, there's no teak. The boat that I had looked at before had so much teak and it was all just like peeling away. And I was just picturing myself eternally sanding and varnishing and yeah. doing everything. And so I'm quite happy that that's the one thing that I like about the more modern style out on deck is not having that teak to maintain mm. it looks really pretty but it's a horrible thing to, <laughs> to deal with i've got a friend who like literally yesterday just started taking up his teak deck and he's got like a choi lee so mm -hmm. it's gorgeous it's so nice like the boat is meant to have a teak deck but like doing all the sanding and then because teak is so expensive 
Like that's it's ridiculous the price of that stuff. I don't think I don't think a lot of boat manufacturers actually use it anymore. I think they go for like more sustainable woods now. Um, but yeah, it's so expensive. So if like if one of those pieces breaks and it's shaped like that, and you have to like get one of those pieces made, it was like oh no, this would be yeah. such a headache. Yeah, like when we've been looking recently, we've been like no, if 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 it comes with a teak deck, like just absolutely forget it not interested yeah. Yeah. so what what on this on the boat you've got now what type of uh, projects did you decide you want to tackle yourself and then what did you want to like outsource the labor for obviously yeah. the engine leave that to yeah. <laughs> an engine so that, person. that whole engine thing uh i it was really tough because at the time i really did want to be a part of that process and i wanted to be really involved with it to give me more knowledge and see it being put in and having a better understanding of that particular engine from scratch from brand new so you know nobody's messed with it nobody's bypassed things like i'll have yeah. a really good idea and so it was kind of i was a little bit butt hurt that i had to leave the country and i was just trusting strangers with the boat mm -hmm. but the, ultimately you know they did a good job they took care of her and now that she's done the main i'm basically tackling everything myself from here on out now that the engine side of everything's good um I just measured yesterday for a solar arch. So I'm just getting nice. it's like the Atlantic Towers arch in a box thing. You've probably seen them. Okay. Um, so yeah, that'll be fun to install. I'm definitely probably going to get a couple. Or is that like a pre-made type? I've not heard of that. We don't yeah, get a lot of stuff over it's here. It's a pre-made thing and it's aluminum, not stainless steel, just so, oh, so nice. it's a little so it's bit light. more affordable. Um, and yeah, they it's just basically, yeah, pre-made arch that you can put on the back and you can get attachments to have like the dinghy davits on them and then a solar on them and oh, everything wow. so that's the main reason um because i had the solar like those flexible solar panels just kind of stuck on deck before yeah and that just it just didn't work for me and they damn near caught fire like it was like not good and yeah, so, everyone I know has used them and said like they're good for a year, and then the yeah. second season they're just putting out like half the amount of energy yeah. that they were before, just because like the plastic turns opaque and stuff like that. Exactly. So I I want to get the you know the harder panels and put them up on the davits or on the arch, and then have davits because I want to get uh, I'm supposed to be getting a new high field dinghy, mm -hmm. and right now I've just got this really really light west marine blow up dinghy that i can basically lift myself and yeah. throw it on deck but you know i putting this new dinghy on deck it's going to be like kind of a pain in the butt and then while you're sailing getting around that and trying to do anything or having that on deck it's just not great so yeah i think the the davits was one thing that I really need to invest in that I think is going to be worth it and then having the solar up on the arch will just take care of a, a lot of things you're right and uh and then I do I have a Garmin chart plotter right now okay but uh what is it the anemometer that's the wind thing uh it's not working and it's not connected and part of me and I have an old radar up there that's also not connected because the it was like this old giant TV radar screen from the oh night. yeah one of those yeah so uh but I have it you know able to mount up there and stuff so I'm really contemplating wanting to go through and go all B and G just because all the boats that I've sailed on have had B and G. I really love it. It's I know how to use it more than anything. Yeah, they are nice. And so it's but it's like you know cost sort of thing and so yeah, yeah it's, it's it's what I want. I know I want it and I know I won't regret it. But you know, with all these other little projects, I actually I have this massive hatch on the right on the stern and it's. 32 inches by like 17 inches okay. so it's a quite a large hatch and it's been discontinued and so i went to order one and the wait time on it's like four to seven weeks just Whoa. for this hatch. how much was it as well like twelve hundred dollars oh no yeah. <laughs> oh, they're it's so like, bad it's like uh it's it's a uh, been discontinued and so it's like the next version of it yeah and it's not a common commonly you know purchased hatch so that's All robbery that, you, know, you know like cruisers should form like a cruisers union where we just start to like destroy some of these brands that are ripping everybody off that's crazy but yeah i know I, I had a friend who um he broke one of the um you know just like the little lumar 
um, port lights that yeah. flip out. I don't know if you call it a port light if it doesn't open up. Anyway, um, yeah, he got a new one of those. And it was one of the smallest ones. And he ended up paying like, I don't know, $600 for it or something like that. It's like literally like one of the ones behind you, probably that size. Just like a little, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, the super tiny ones. It's like, oh my God, that's crazy. You can get cheaper ones, but... Um, I have a friend who had, who had a boat next to me. Yeah, he got one of the cheap ones and then he stood on it and he fell through it. So <laughs> like, I know the Lumo ones don't do that. So yeah, he tried yeah. to blame it on like a random drunk girl. He's like, oh, I had these girls on my boat. I was like, you never have girls on your boat, mate. And he was like, <laughs> oh, no, I don't. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so you just stood on it. <laughs> but yeah, they're so expensive. Have you figured out what type of B&G system you'd get? Are you going for like the full thing with the cameras and the radar and all that yeah i mean i'm i like the idea the main reason also that is appealing to me about that is um kind of their their bluetooth windex that you can have yeah then you don't have to go and wire it and that's quite nice and then um definitely radar for sure and then probably a smaller size chart plotter because some of the big ones start to get up there and priced and so i haven't decided i think there's one of the highest models has like the auto routing thing within it. Yeah. And I think since... the, you can get, that's like nine. I'm sure the seven inch one is like 900 or, well, I don't know how much it costs wh where you are, but I'm sure like not. So B and G do the entry model and then they do a slightly mm -hmm. better one. I can't remember the names. There's so many, there's so many different models. Um, But yeah, I know the better one. I'm sure the seven inch one was like $900 or something like that when it looks. Yeah. Which is and a so lot of money. It's really nice, like, especially because I'm so used to that system. And it's like now after using it so much on other people's boats, going back to this Garmin thing, it's like going back to, it's like having a Mac and then going back to like an old Windows PC. Like yeah. it just seems so archaic. Yeah. And so <laughs> maybe that's like vain <laughs> to say, but I just, I, the aesthetics of it are better too. No, they are. I think they're better for sailing as well. I was. Uh, it's definitely more geared towards that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Rather than motorboating or fishing, we were having like a really long conversation. There was a, there was a group of us on in a, in our cockpit. We ended up. I think we were staying up till about four or five in the morning just talking about chart plotters. We got a, it was a bit intense. Um, but yeah, like the consensus everybody came to was just like yeah, for sailing B and G are like without a doubt the best. Oh, yeah. 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 Although I do sure. like the way Raymarine look. So you've had so you had experience on the C fifty the CT fifty six and then you had experience on the um, the ML the yes. Super Maramu. What was that like? Did you get to sail that quite a lot? Yeah, that was amazing. Um, I was on board for about three months, and so we went from the Keys to Mexico, spent about a month in Mexico, and then sailed down to Panama and. Mm -hmm. That crossing, both of those crossings were just unreal. Like we were blessed with amazing conditions, like 85% of the time. Yeah. And Delos is just such a solid boat. Like it can just yeah. plow through anything and it's so solid and it loves it too. Like, you know, you get a day where it picks up to 25 and you're beating into it and she's just going along and like, mm -hmm. not it, she just is having fun and it's, it was awesome to be on such a good boat with such a good crew of people. It was all around such a positive experience. And I think that helped. I mean, I already know my foundations of sailing, so it wasn't like I was learning the basics, but I feel like that experience more so kind of honed in and defined my skills more yeah. so. Um, and so after that, I walked away from that feeling like I could use a lot of everything that I learned and apply it to my own boat. And I feel more confident even coming back now and wanting to set off on basically the same journey. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's reassuring to know that I've kind of done that crossing from the Keys to Mexico and having done it, I know what to expect. And um, I learned a lot definitely about passage planning too, just the way that they do it like uh, Brian and Karen are such a well-oiled machine together. They just work so well together. So being able to see their thought process and their preparation and kind of their lists and what they do to, you know, ensure everybody's safety, ensure that it's going to be a good trip. It's not going to be crappy weather. We're not going to get beaten up. 
um, yeah, I just, I definitely learned so much from that. It'll be really interesting to see that actually, you know, like the in-depths of like what, because they've got so much experience, like yeah. so much experience, like, you know, what, what exactly are they looking out for with the weather window? What exactly do they want out of the boat? Like the pre-checks that they do, that type of stuff. And like, you've been able to absorb all that and, you know, bring it to your boat, which is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. definitely feel um, more knowledge or no, knowledgeable, more well prepared, more confident. Um, but I would definitely, I'd love to go sailing on that boat again. I just, it made me want an ML. Like, as far as like <laughs> upgrading to another to another blue water boat, that would be. <coughs> yeah, you just need an extra few hundred thousand dollars <laughs> under yeah. your belt. Yeah, almost it's a million. So nice yeah but they're so expensive it's crazy like because we, we've been like looking in that range we've decided we're going to get like an older geno just because it's it just ticks all the boxes for us in terms of like layout with a family and stuff um but they, they are i mean they're they're brilliant they are so so good they're so strong at crossing oceans and they're built like a tank like i mean it literally drives like a bus you've got like a huge wheel on one side yeah. um they're so so heavy and they can smash into the waves they're, they're brilliant but they're so expensive like if you want a decent one of those now, they're, they're still like $400,000. At least, yeah. And for an old one, yeah. <laughs> you know, they've really not lost the value. I know. Yeah, it would be interesting to speak to someone who's like, with, like probably even Brian would have a great take on this, if he could then spend time on one of the newer ones. Because um, that would be like the ultimate test of, are the newer boats as good as yeah. the older ones? I think they did go, they did a tour of the ML factory or they got All right. to go see one of the newer ones or something like that. I don't remember what happened, but I think they've done something like that because they were curious too to see kind of what the newer take on things were. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a friend who does like, um, so he does deliveries across the Mediterranean, um, but he basically sells the cabin spaces when he does his deliveries. And he's like a fully qualified skipper. I think he's done his like his ocean master OIA. OIA so he's a really, really good sailor. And um, yeah, like whenever I've had conversations with him about different types of boats, especially like more the production boats where, you know, they were doing really strong ones in the nineties and now they're doing ones which are more catered for charters. And he's like, general opinion is just like, if it's new, forget it. Like, I just guarantee you, it's just not going to be as good as as one that was like around in the 90s or or anything like that. So I don't know. I've, I don't know if it's like the shape of the hull or the interior or whatever. Like you, old cars. And stuff. They were just built with love back then. Everything was built with love back then. Yeah. Do you know, though, it's like, oh, so so you bike and you've and you've got a van. So and they're, they're both like from the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was the best era because that is like a truly mechanical era for transport. In the 90s, it started to become a little bit too computerized where like ECU started to do the majority of the work, but like they didn't have as much experience with it kind of. Do you know what I mean? It's just like they just it started. Like, it, was it. Their, it was the pinnacle of trying to be more technologically advanced without yeah. actually having without it. the experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so like that's uh, I I think like the worst spot for like well more modernish type of cars is like the nineties to the early two thousands because yeah. they just have yeah. not mastered it. Totally. Um, but yeah, like the eighties stuff. What type? What type of bike have you got? Um, <coughs> a Yamaha Radian. It's oh a nice. CC. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fun little bike. Um, it's it's not running so hot anymore. I mean, it still runs, but it's getting a little tired for sure. Right. Have you done a lot of um, have you done a lot of miles on it? No, I bought it with a lot of miles on it just because I bought it used. I mean, mm. it's an 80s bike. So um, I think it had like 40,000 kilometers on it when I bought it. Okay. And I put probably 5,000 on maybe in the last couple of years. Mm, so it's not so a lot not... for a bike of its age. Yeah. Not that much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So with the boat that you've got now, you've got a few little bits you need to fix up on it. Like it sounds like mostly electronics and stuff that you need to get ready for. Yeah, it. it's mostly just upgrading now. Like everything is pretty much solid as far as like the mechanical stuff goes. Um, I am planning on getting new sales from Precision Sales. 
Oh, nice. So uh, I'm probably just going to leave the dock and hop down the coast of Florida a little bit with these old ones before I, I get the new ones. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's the matter of that arch and the electronics. And those are basically upgrades. Like, I mean, I could leave now if I really wanted to, but while I'm in the US, I'm trying to get everything as set as I need it to be and get everything done right and have everything be, you know, as proper as I can get it and not look back because I don't want to have my boat in the US anymore. I want to get to the Caribbean. I want to get somewhere, you know, with nice blue water and just get out of here. Yeah. And even just for fixing it up as well, like the further south you go, well, the not in Florida, but yeah, once you once you get into the Caribbean, yeah, it's definitely going to be a lot harder and a hell of a lot more expensive exactly. to start fixing stuff up. So that's What's... why. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, so no, no, I was just I was just ask a different question. So go on, what were you saying? I was just saying that's why it's like kind of I've kind of got to bite the bullet financially now, knowing that I've got to tackle all these things at once, yeah. and it all kind of adds up a lot, but then in the end, I know that if I put something like this off, it's going to bite me in the butt later on in a place that's, it'll end up being 10 times more expensive to do that thing that I should have done. Yeah. Back in the oh yeah. It's worth time. doing. Yeah. I know, I know a lot of people say, oh, you know, if you're waiting on the dock, like if you're trying to get your boat perfect, you'll be stuck on the dock for ages. Yeah. I, I agree with that, but there are certain comforts. Yeah. I like to be comfortable on a boat. I don't like yeah. to be on a boat and be worried that the thing's going to sink. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, and, I mean, I did that. I've been there and done that. I bought this boat in November in New York and I set sail maybe three weeks later. I mean, I added an autopilot and that was pretty much it. And then I spent the next four months freezing my butt off and freezing cold, crappy, rough climates. Now I'm like, okay, I'm going to be patient. I'm going to take the time. Yeah. I'm going to wait. I'm going to get everything done. And then I'm going to feel good when I go and not feel rushed. So you're, you're a solo sailor. That's fair to say. I mean, yeah, I did a lot of solo stuff coming down, um, getting down to Florida. Yeah. I did quite a few bits of it. Um, kind of my limitation or my personal boundaries with solo sailing was I don't like going offshore and doing anything overnight. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, like the next step, I, I suppose. I don't think that that's safe. Like, I mean, at night already, if you fall overboard, you're basically dead, but not having anybody to even try and turn the boat around or look for you, yeah, you're done. And so, you know, that safety-wise, I kind of stayed within the protection of the ICW for a lot of it. Um, for the bigger offshore jumps that I did do, I had crew uh, just to kind of do that. And then, yeah, I mean, I think being solo taught me the most just that I have to rely on myself and it kind of forced me to have to learn everything and to step up to the plate and be like okay I can't call for help it's either me or it's nothing and mm. and a lot of times you have to make decisions so quickly and you have to know what to do and so I had a lot of like trials and tribulations and challenges and at the time while I was in it I was so frustrated and just disappointed and like so done with there being problems all the time and now looking back on it I realized how much I learned from that yeah and that you know now I know a lot about engines like I seeing this new engine go and I recognize what everything is because I've worked on it on the last one yeah. and so now looking back I realized how much I learned and like gained from being solo because it forced me to get in there, get my hands dirty, gain the knowledge because I had no other choice. But at the same time, I think it's definitely, it's way more fun to have other people and to share memories with people and um, keeps things lighthearted and it makes it easier when crap hits the fan because you at least have somebody mm. to help take care of things. So yeah. I, moving forward, I'm definitely more keen on on having crew. And I think something just through my own experience a little bit that I've had um, being a solo sailor and being a young woman is um, just how traditional and very much of a man's world sailing still kind of is. And so oh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to have like an epic all girl crew and like rock up to a dock and be like, yeah, that's right. We did it. And just like own it and have fun and give girls a chance to go sailing and see if that's something they want to do. And, you know, I feel like a lot of women who don't necessarily have experience 
it's hard to figure out or learn how to get into the lifestyle. Yeah. Um, like pe a lot of people are like, okay, I want to gain experience. So I want to crew on somebody's boat, but a lot of people don't want an experienced crew. Yeah. And so from my point of view, I know I can do it solo. So I really don't need experienced people. I just need hands. Like I just need bodies, somebody to throw lines, do fenders, like, you know, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. giving women the opportunity to try it out who might not have any experience and letting them have fun with it and hopefully inspiring them is kind of what my goal is moving forward for this next season. Yeah, that's really good. That's that's really cool. Because do you know what like I do? Like, okay, so like I suppose your average sailor is probably a guy maybe in his 50s to maybe in his 50s I think that's probably your average yeah. sailor some, something like that and it's like yeah I can imagine if like there's a young girl in her 20s who's like oh I'd love to like learn how to sail and stuff it's like well okay what are your options you pay a fortune for classes oh you go on a, a boat with like a dude in his 50s who's like not married like maybe not <laughs> you know you exactly. might, might get put off by that yeah so, you're like um, what are my options here <laughs> yeah exactly and so, yeah. you know being and it it I'm a part of the um, the Young Cruisers Association. Um, oh yeah, what is that? And it's it's just like a band of young. It's a it's an organization connecting other young cruisers, creating meetups for people, just trying to connect. Oh nice. Like young people who are sailing, because it's you know it's not all that often, like you said, in the sailing world that you come by young people who are doing this lifestyle. And mm. uh, so again, being like a young person and being kind of a safe, comfortable place for women to come and learn from and have it not be intimidating or cost a fortune. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Is that something that you want to do for this season coming up then? Do you want to like yeah. find a few uh, crewmates to head yeah, down? Yeah, that's uh, basically what I'm working on right now because before I got back recently, I actually wasn't sure if I was even going to be able to get back to my boat um, mm -hmm. just with some issues with the border patrol. I there was a possibility that they wouldn't let me back into the US and that my boat was going to be stuck in the US. And so I was just waiting out until I knew for sure that I could get here to kind of organize crew. And so right now that's kind of what I'm going through and doing is reaching out. I made a post once before about, you know, just putting it out there to any women who would want to come sailing with me. And so I'm kind of following up with a lot of those people and just trying to organize dates and times and kind of get a good crew sorted out for this season yeah that's really difficult I mean especially like because people haven't worked for quite a while like getting people who can take a month off like at this time of year leading up to our holidays and stuff yeah that'd be tough I was talking to a guy last week who's just in the process of releasing an app which is it's a I'm sure there's websites that do it but it's an application that is just for finding crew so you go on you put like your profile on there and your experience and you it's like you know it's an app just that's fancy awesome. and modern yeah, yeah. that's a I mean, great resource yeah i think it's called saley um it's got like a profile on instagram but um yeah it just sounds like a really good idea like for connecting mm. people especially for passages because there's loads of people who've got so much experience doing like coastal sailing but they've never been offshore and yeah. that's it's an intimidating thing um although to be honest i think like coastal sailing is actually much more dangerous than sailing offshore <laughs> in some ways there's no rocks to hit you know if you're <laughs> out in the middle of the ocean so i think it's a bit more peaceful um hopefully it's usually downwind as well um but yeah that that part of it can be really intimidating so yeah like having an app where you can just like find like passages or boats to jump on would be really and, good and like keeps it keeps it safe too because it's a public platform where people have to put their profile it's yeah. like that, a little more safety conscious and not just some complete rando on the internet <laughs> yeah i've heard some horror stories like oh, some gosh. horror yeah so like on on like um because I'm, I'm friends with like quite a few people that do like charters and crew and then they bring people on board and that type of stuff and it's yeah like people coming on board for as crew they end up stealing stuff they end up like leaving with the dinghy um oh, no. yeah there was one story there was one story like uh i think they took a girl she was from one of the caribbean countries i can't remember which one mm -hmm. but the guy messed up because basically if you take crew on board i don't know the details about this but this is what he told me so if you take crew on board you do actually need to pay them something but what is what it is exactly i don't know but then they arrived in this country which was her home country and they uh because he hadn't paid her she just went straight to the police and was just like oh he hasn't paid me for my work 
And uh, yeah, I got him in trouble, apparently. I don't know how much trouble he got him, but it was like crazy. He gave her an opportunity to crew and then she like she like uh, went to the authorities. And just, Ouch, dang. Yeah, give him a hard time about it. So yeah, what, well, what's... fingers crossed. I don't have too many bad experiences with crew. Yeah, I think, yeah, it would be, I think it'll be okay. So, so what's the plan then? You're leaving Florida sometime soon to head down to Mexico. Yes. yes. Um, so the goal is to leave here in Stewart and start hopping down towards the Keys probably mid to end of December. Okay. Um, and so that from here to Key West, which is where I ultimately want to end up, um to get to kind of stage for the crossing to mexico yeah. um it'll probably be i mean at least a week of just kind of hopping down the coast to get down to the keys and then yeah from there kind of get my people together get all the last minute stuff together and i hope to be in mexico by january nice yeah how long do you think you'll stay there for sure i mean we when i was uh on board delos we stayed in isla Mujeres for about a month yeah. which it's a really small island so like after two weeks we were kind of ready to get out of there but then we got pinned down by weather so i mean i'd say two to three weeks ideally i'd probably stay because i i'm keen to move down to belize and hop down there because i've actually okay. got an uncle who lives there who's like building out a, a dock yeah. So I'm hoping that that might be done in a couple of months by the time that I get down there and then have a dock to be able to stay at and believe. Yeah, you got a free berth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that would be nice. That would be sweet. So, and then eventually get down to Panama someday, but I'm trying to keep the goals small right now. It's just my immediate goal is to get down to Key West and then get to Mexico. And then from there, I'll plan further on. Yeah, I think it's the right strategy. It's like, just do these little trips, especially to get your comfort level up as well. And like, if you're on your own also, like just get those little trips in, bit of motor, bit of sailing, wait for like really nice conditions and just set off for that. Exactly. And yeah, so maybe like next year you'll be in the Pacific Ocean, who knows? You know, it's so funny. I'm like, I every year I think, I wonder where I'll be in a year. And every time I'm always surprised. I never... <laughs> I never You're know. always wrong, but I in a good way. I predict what, what's <laughs> going to happen next with me, so. Yeah, French Polynesia, perhaps, this time next year. That would be, be pretty sweet. That would be a nice I one. I would love to do, um, I think, something I really want to do is, like, a, is a full-on, like, ocean crossing. I mean, the I've been offshore for... Uh, 11 days before mm -hmm. that was like the most time and then from Mexico to Panama was like seven days and I mean 11 days is pretty long yeah yeah that was from um, the Virgin Islands back to the east coast of the U.S. because of COVID we couldn't stop at any of the islands like all the right. way back so we kind of just had to do the straight crossing so now I'm feeling super ready to do an ocean crossing but I don't want to do it on my own boat and I don't want to be the captain like I'm ready to be crew. <laughs> I want to get the experience of doing an ocean passage on somebody else's boat. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe that's in the cards for me someday, but yeah, I don't know. I feel, I hope that the South Pacific opens up more. I know it's pretty bad right now with COVID and a lot of people are holding off cruising down there just because a lot of the places are so restricted and difficult okay. and, you know, things like that. So hopefully by next year, they'll start to open things up and it'll be a bit easier so that more people can go cruising out that way yeah it's so cool though like being you know do, doing what what you do it just gives you so many more opportunities to like travel as well like meeting more people and like connecting with more people I mean you know it's crazy like you could meet someone and then six months later you're on a boat with them like sailing over to like Tahiti like yeah what a exactly. life yeah yeah what a life well listen thanks very much for taking the time and um yeah well done like just you know great great journey that you've been on and taken everybody on as well so that's that's uh, very very it. good of you <laughs> so yeah thank you very much for your time yeah thanks it was awesome to uh to get to chat with you a little bit Oops.